maybe check that and uh uh oh what's that hmm. Hmm. hi how are you welcome hi rupa how are you good thank you thanks for your help in getting this set up oh no problem great to have you here appreciate it dom you, you eat uh, mandarin or yeah, what are we seeing on our screen here? <laughs> That's not mine. I see. Let me um, see who might be sharing. There we go. All right, there we go. We should be all set. So if you want to start sharing your screen, we can just make sure that. Okay. Comes through. Let me. Uh, let me get set up for. You. There we go. You guys seeing it? Uh, not just yet. Hmm. Okay, let's try it. So I got you on screen. Okay, here it is. Let's try this. I see your screen now. Okay, let's see. Make sure we got the actual talk up. How's that? Yeah, that looks good. It looks like um, we're seeing the presenter view, though. So I don't know if you want to switch it to the other screen so that they, um, we just see the slide. Yeah, uh, presenter view and slideshow. How's that? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Boom. So it'll be just a few more minutes. Uh, our residents are in our case conference this morning. So uh, the residents and faculty will be trickling in in the next few minutes. Great. Make it happen. You have one of my former co-residents as one of your partners, I think, Andrew. Oh, Andrew uh, uh, Healy. Yeah. He's fantastic. He's a great guy. Yeah, he's he's uh, he was a year ahead of me at, at the clinic. At Cleveland. So did you, uh, you wouldn't have known Paul Kim. He did his fellowship there at all. He's one of our other partners. Yeah, I think I did. I think we overlapped. Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of spine fellows. But yeah, I think Paul was, a, was there uh, when I was a junior as well. Um, yeah, he's great. Uh, Andrew's great. Yeah, we he's one of my favorite residents. I just saw him when I, I was down in North Carolina in Charlotte uh, a few months ago and I saw him. Yeah, he's a great guy. He and Jane are great. They're yeah, they're great really addition good. to the group. He's a great surgeon, a great guy. Good. Yeah, I'm so but yeah, he seems really happy. So it's hard to keep up. I think we got to like 43 guys now. 43 oh guys and gals. Wow. Yeah. Wow. It's incredible. You must be the biggest group, right, in that state? I think we're the biggest group in the country now. Yeah. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I think Duke has like 12. Uh, Wake Forest has like nine. Actually, our hospital system, in which we were, we're an independent group, but we work that spine first deal up on the first slide is a, um, is a uh, joint venture that we have with the Atrium Medical uh, the atrium healthcare system to deliver spine care and atrium just took over wake forest so that's kind of interesting oh. yeah that is interesting that's a separate lecture one day yeah yeah well that's a atrium's a 20 billion dollar uh yeah hospital system and uh and, and like i said we literally just inked the joint venture with them uh last week to do co-management and potential and gain sharing, et cetera. So we're, we're pretty excited about oh, it. Congratulations. It's such a, it's such a dominant system. My brother lives in the area and you know, it's atrium everywhere. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're right, Roger. That's a talk for another time. <laughs> Roger, it looks like people are starting to trickle in now. So I'd imagine in the next minute or two. Where are you from originally, Rupa? Uh, Northern Virginia, just outside DC. Uh, 
Nice. But I went to Duke, so I'm a I'm a North Carolinan at heart. Oh, me too. I oh, did you? Myself, yeah, absolutely. Oh. My sort of my daughter. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Blue Devils. Go Devils, Devils pulling for K's last year hard, pulling hard for that last season. I know. I know it was. It's uh, and I th it's Coach K's last year, so I'm a little bit devastated, yep. but. <laughs> yeah. Have to make it down for some games this year. I know the swan song. Me too. I, I used to have season tickets, uh, but it was it was quite the um, haul to get over to Durham like 20 times a year. You right. Know, it was nine o'clock games coming back at two o'clock in the morning. With I'm the sure it made you very cases. popular though with those season tickets. <laughs> yeah. All right, Roger. It looks like we have a little bit of a critical mass. So whenever you're ready. Yeah. Sure. So good morning and. Welcome everybody. It gives me great pleasure today to introduce as our visiting professor, even though he's only virtually visiting, a guest speaker, Dr. Dom Korich, who uh, I've known for many years, of course. Uh, Dom is uh, a neurosurgeon at Carolina Neurosurgery and Spine Associates in Charlotte, North Carolina. He also serves as the chief of the Department of Neurosurgery at Carolina's Medical Center. Now, Dom has been involved uh, heavily in, in organized neurosurgery and advocacy over the years. Currently, he serves as the president of the International Society of the Advancement of Spine Surgery, which is a society that's really focused on uh, new technology and uh, a lot of exciting developments in, 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 the, in the spine spine field. He's also currently the chair of the AANS CNS Spine Section. Now, Dom has been uh, involved in a lot of research and also in a lot of the clinical trials that led to the, uh, uh, the uh, implementation of artificial disc replacement, for example, endoscopic uh, spine surgery. And today he's going to talk about a topic that, that uh, you know, we here found very, very exciting. And that's the reason why we decided to invite him, which is cervical uh, pedicle screw, cerv cervical percutaneous fixation with navigation. Now, when, when it comes to minimally invasive, minimally invasive spinal surgery, there are really two frontiers. One is complex deformity. And uh, you know, Kai uh, has, has published on that, how MIS slowly kind of uh, really uh, becomes uh, capable of, of treating some of the more complex deformity cases. But the other frontier is really cervical. And, and we don't have really good uh, technology available these days to really take advantage of minimally invasive spinal surgery in the cervical spine. And, and that's why Dom, I think, uh, uh, has really contributed significantly. And that's why we invited him today to talk about his experience with, with navigation in the cervical spine and with cervical pedicle screw and percutaneous cervical instrumentation. So, so thanks, Dom, for being here and looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Roger. It's an honor to, to uh, be speaking to you this morning. Thanks, uh, Rupa, for getting everything set up. And uh, it's, I'm just happy to be here. Uh, like I said, I wish we were in person, but this has become kind of the new norm. So uh, this is not meant to be, this is very case, uh, heavy case oriented and meant to be kind of an interaction. So I'd love for the residents to chime in as we go, if there are any questions. And like Roger said, this is not really, um, this is a little bit of uncharted territory. So anyone has questions as to the function of how to try to spell, spell it out, but we'll, uh, we'll get to it right now. This is my disclosure. This is my group in Charlotte. We're, uh, um, it's an outdated picture because all our pictures are outdated because we're always adding guys. We're up to, I believe, 43 uh, surgeons now. And uh, so uh, we're, and we're affiliate, we're an independent uh, private practice group, but we have uh, interaction with the atrium um, healthcare system down here. We deliver uh, spine care for exclusively for the system uh, as far as the management of that, including the residency program, which we just uh, graduated our first resident this past summer. So we're, we're excited about that. Uh, like Roger talked about, uh, there's no question that MIS techniques have become more popular, but most of the attention has been paid to the thoracolumbar lumbar spine. The cervical MIS uh, procedures have focused on decompressive surgeries, and Roger's really been at the forefront of that. There's no question about it with minimally invasive and endoscopic. 
it's, it's kind of interesting because ACDF really, if you think about it, it's, it's been around forever, but ACDF is minimally invasive, right? It, we do it outpatient. It, it uh, doesn't involve a lot of morbidity, but posterior cervical fixation is still a fairly morbid operation. And the fixation techniques have lagged behind uh, largely in part to uh, the, the critical vascular and neurological structures in the posterior cervical spine, especially up at C1, C2, but as well as the vertebral artery and the nerves at the subaxial levels. So we know that there's a void here, um, and that void is that the, the traditional open approaches have significant morbidity associated with them. It doesn't take long to see a patient or two that has the kind of serial bowl in the back of their neck with the muscle atrophy from a posterior approach, or they, they say that their instrumentation is sticking out and it's not their instrumentation, it's their spinous process. And doesn't take very many of those cases to say that there really has got to be a better way um, additionally, cervical, in addition to the, the, the muscle morbidity, certain lateral mass screws are not particularly powerful. They're, they're relatively small screws uh, and they take a divergent trajectory. And so the lateral mass screws at three, five by 14 are, are the most common screws, not really uh, um, a very robust biomechanically. I've got the Abumi reference here from the 90s and early 2000s. Abumi uh, it was, is in Japan. He did a fellowship here in the States. He talked about doing a lot of uh, um, um, pedicle screw fixation, open pedicle screw fixation in the cervical spine, but he used fluoroscopic guidance, which is really um, kind of a bear. And you, know, you have to be sort of a master surgeon like he is, uh, as opposed to kind of you know, what I'm going to talk about, which is more uh, navigation and technology dependent. Um, so when we talk about cervical fixation, we know the pedicle screw fixation is standard of care for thoracolumbar lumbar spine. And, we've done, and there have been several studies that have talked about open pedicle screw fixation, both biomechanically and clinically. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I want to spend time on uh, the actual cases. But if we look at the biomechanics and on the left, we see uh, standard uh, lateral mass fixation. On the right, we see an actual case of mine. Uh, and we see the difference in the pedicle screw trajectory, the medial trajectory, the, the screw size typically can get up to 5.0 or 5.5, uh, and the length could be anywhere from 22 to 30, 32 millimeters. So it's much more biomechanically robust uh, fixation. There's no question about it. And to talk about that, um, we can talk about some biomechanical studies quickly. And so this is a nice study by Johnson. And so I'm not going to go into the specifics of it, but basically looked at the difference between pedicle screws and lateral mass screws, the same size screws. And uh, so even though we can put bigger uh, and longer screws in those pedicles, he looked at the same size lateral mass versus pedicle screws. And basically he found mean pullout strength is four times stronger in the pedicle screw situation. And the failure methods were very different. The lateral mass failure was a screw pull out from the bone, which lamentably we've all seen at one point or another, whereas the pedicle screw uh, uh, failure was a fracture at the pedicle ju uh, body junction. So again, in biomechanically, much more, uh, much more robust construct. If we look at the anatomy of the pedicle screws, one of the problems with cervical pedicle screws is, is that they get pretty fairly lateral and you see how they move medially up at C2 and then they get smaller uh, at C3 and C4, but and they get very lateral at C5 and then they start moving back in. T1, T2s are, are typically uh, thoracic, upper thoracic pedicle screws are typically much more medial, but we have this natural lateral to medial angle that we could take we take advantage of with the muscle splitting approach. And that's where the thought process led to a lot of what we're talking about. So before I paint it as all hunky-dory, uh, there are some challenges. So the pedicles aren't huge. Um, you can't really get that medial angle angulation that you need with a midline incision, certainly without uh, doing extensive muscle dissection and muscle um, uh, removal from the from their uh, bony and ligamentous attachments. And then you, you always have the proximity of the neurovascular structures. And really the key thing here that has made this biomechanically robust procedure uh, feasible is the improvements in intraoperative navigation. So this is really a navigation-based procedure. So, um, and it circumvents the drawbacks of open pedicle screw fixation because you can go laterally and you can take the trajectory you want and it's muscle splitting and you're getting this pow powerful biomechanical uh, 
um, uh, fixation. And this is uh, this our original series that we published last year in uh, IJSS uh, that talks about this mu muscle splitting technique. And I'll talk briefly about that, but I wanted us to stay more focused on the, uh, the actual cases. So I'm gonna jump right into that um, right now. Um, and like I said, uh, we're gonna kind of go over the, the, the uh, a kaleidoscope of cases from C1, C2, as well as subaxial tumor trauma. Uh, trauma has been really, it's, this has been a godsend for trauma and we'll talk about some of that. But the first case is a 69 year old gentleman who was involved, had a C6, seven fracture dislocation. He was a complete spinal cord injury. Um, one of my other partners was on call and it wasn't one of our complex spine specialists and he did a good job of fixating him anteriorly, uh, but he didn't fully reduce his fracture and there was a lot of stress at, on the construct. So we looked at that construct and basically said, um, this is a fairly unstable fracture and I don't know that that anterior one level ACDF is going to hold. So uh, before we packed him off to rehab, uh, we decided that we, he should get some posterior fixation, but he didn't need any further decompression because he was realigned with his ACDF. He was complete and there was no ongoing hematoma or compression. So this is how we do it. And you, so it's just a standard Mayfield uh, head frame, three point. Sometimes we use the Jackson table. Sometimes we just use the Skytron table. We start out with the Skytron standard uh, prep and drape, but you have to go wide. It's a lot wider than you think. And so when I talk to people about this, they think they think thoracal lumbar pedicle screws four or five centimeters off the midline. This is way off the midline potentially. And so you really have to get this wide prep all the way out here on both sides. So basically what we make is just a two centimeter skin incision. Uh, this is C7 fracture dislocation, so we could palpate the T1 pedicle screw. We don't need fluoro or anything. Just before, at, right after we drape, before we do anything else, make a two centimeter incision, drop the reference frame on the spinous process, and then bring in the uh, intraoperative cone beam CT. Uh, and then we plan our entry points from there. Here's Vince, one of my senior uh, residents who's doing a spine fellowship in Australia this year. He was, he and I have done a bunch of these together, and here I am. Here's the setup in the in the in the case. And one of the reasons I put this is because you can see he's planning his trajectories, um, but he's not looking at the wound. He's looking up at the uh, at the screen. And the same thing with me over here on my side. So we plan our entry points, and then we make a lateral incision. At, in contradistinction to the um, thoracal lumbar spine, the 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 uh, percutaneous incisions are so close together that we found it easier just to make a lateral, a single lateral incision, skin incision, and do separate um, and separate uh, fascial incision. So this is how it looks. Sorry, uh, this is how it looks, and you can see the reference frame and you can see the just the two small incisions we're working we can work um, side by side drill a pilot hole and then use a power tap with a um, three millimeter tap <coughs> all under fluoroscopic guidance and you see here putting in the screws the screws have towers you can see how lateral they are and then you have the percutaneous placement of the screws you can see the Perk rod right here that's being placed through the towers. He's final tightening his side. I'm passing the, screw, the rod on my side. This is the final incision. We don't have that one giant big, 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 big midline incision. This is muscle sparing. It's going through the muscle and it's taking the muscle planes because it's so laterally. There's just a little reference frame. Here's his final construct, and you can see he's got pedicle screws at C5, C6, C7, and T1 bilaterally. Much more robust fixation than we would get with lateral mass. And so here's his final construct. He's mobilized without a collar. He he could get it, he gets over to rehab post-operative day two, as opposed to kind of writhing around in pain and wearing a, a collar or a halo for a period of time, no collars. Um, and then that's his final construct. These are the implant sizes. If we look at the pedicle screws, instead of three five by 14s, we're looking at three eights by 28, 26, 22, 28. And then the typical bigger T1 screws. And so a much more robust construct. 
Um, and that's uh, that's subaxial trauma. This is kind of my new favorite case with um, uh, with this uh, technique because C1, C2 fixation is really um, made, the trajectories are made to do minimally invasively. So this is a 74 year old and she uh, has a fracture at C2. It's interesting because she complained of neck pain and then three days later, she actually fell and broke her neck. And so she has a CT scan three days after her initial scan. She has a standard type two odontoid. Here's her initial scan. You can see this weird cystic change that she has in her odontoid. I don't know if that was causing her pain, but it certainly caused her to predispose towards having a fracture. And if you look at the fracture, it's posteriorly displaced. You see this huge gap and it's really not a great case for C1, C2 fixation. I mean, I'm sorry, it's not a great case for anterior odontoid screw fixation because of this big gap and this cystic area. So you can see here, she has a reflection extension in the CT scan. She's definitely moving. You can see the her uh, spinal uh, laminar line is way back here. You can see the posterior displacement. Here we are intraoperatively, and you can see here we use the reference frame right on the uh, uh, right on the uh, three point Mayfield. So we prep that into the field, and she's got these incisions for her C two fixation and these incisions for the C one fixation. And we drop the screws directly through these top screws and put some bone in through the top incisions, not the top screws. This is her final uh, uh, derma bond uh, incision, no brace. She's post-operative day two. She went home without a brace. Here's her fixation. And you can see um, getting maximizing the pars, screws in C2. And here's the lateral mass trajectories into C1. Uh, and you can see the anatomy there. Here's her vert. And you can see how we're able to get nice purchase of the screws come up right up against the vert. Here's how it looked intraoperatively. We got a quick fluoro shot to tell us where we want to put our bottom incision. Then our top incision is easy, it's just here. Here's the construct before the rods are passed. Here's the final construct. And then that's how she went home on post-operative day number two. Here she was with her derma bond. Here she was at one month. Here she is at three month office visit. You can see none of that denervation that you see of the, of the posterior musculature. The pain difference is night and day. These older folks are tough to begin with, uh, but I tell you, they this is a very well tolerated procedure compared to an open procedure. Here's her final flexion extension views at, I believe this were one year views for her. So she went on to, um, to have a nice fixation infusion here. Here's her final CT scan. And it's interesting because you, what you're seeing here is the actual bone that was laid down. So everyone says, can you get some bone in there? And the answer is, yeah, there's bone here. There's bone here. There's bone. We typically put the bone under um, under the screws and then drop the screws in above. But these arrows are pointing to the bone. There's the fixation in the lateral mass of C1 and then C2. Um, and so that is uh, um, that is one of our earlier ones in the series. And so she's, like I said, out towards a year now. Here's one that we just did a couple of weeks ago. So this is a 90 year old patient. So this is a problem. Uh, and there's 90 year old, she gets a, um, a CT uh, for axial neck pain uh, in, uh, in November. And she's noted to have scoliosis and osteoporosis. She's status post this kyphoplasty. She's 90 years old. Then she falls uh, four months later uh, and then she has a C1, C2 fracture. She's slapped in a collar like most of these folks are. They don't hot tolerate a halo. No one wants to be operating on a 90-year-old, but she is an active, healthy 90-year-old. Uh, so four months later in July, she presents with still intractable, persistent neck pain. Imaging shows no healing of the, of the fracture, and you can still see the fracture site, and you can see the movement on her spinal laminar line back here. Now she is getting about halfway into her canal here. You can imagine her canal right there. There's the C1 fracture. There's the C2 fracture mobile at four months. Here's her pre-op CT when she was complaining of neck pain. And you can see it's not a pretty looking image, but here's her fracture four months later. And you can see the, the end plates, are, the, uh, the edges are now getting corticated. 
She has virtually no healing. She still displays. This is way too late to even consider an anterior odontoid screw, which is tough in 90 year old with the swallowing difficulties. You can see her initial uh, scan and you can see again, she's beginning to corticate her edges. Here's her C1 fracture, ring fracture. So this is a problem. And so are you gonna put her in a halo? Well, I mean, that's pretty much a death sentence has been my experience in a 90 year old. Are you gonna put her in a hard collar? What are the chance of healing that? Like 50% max. Um, so are you gonna do an open C1 fixation fusion? Sure, fairly more, but more of an operation. You can't do anterior odontoid because it's non-healed. Um, you could do an occipital cervical fixation, even more morbid, and you're getting into her all the subaxial pathology that she has. So the question becomes, you know, really you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. So she undergoes a percutaneous MISC1 C2 fixation fusion. Here again, we put the uh, fiducial reference frame on the actual uh, head frame on the actual uh, three point uh, Mayfield head frame. And you, there's the reference frame. You have the camera up here, cephalad. Here's the patient's head. Here we are putting in the, the, C, the C2 screws, which are the lower stab incision, the higher one are the C1 screws. What's interesting in her is that she had favorable anatomy. So I decided to do a C1, C2 transarticular screw uh, on, uh, uh, on this side. And you can see the trajectory planning right from the skin. So we know, know where to put our skin incision. And you can see this fairly robust long screw that's getting purchased across the C2 pars across the transarticular space and, and trying to get almost bicortical purchase here in C1. Here's the final screw that goes in. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have screws without tulips, so this is just a, an orphan screw, but it's a C1, C2 transarticular screw. On the opposite side, you can see this vert is high riding. She's not going to get a C1, C2 transarticular screw in any way, shape, or form. So here's the planning for a C1 lateral. Oh, sorry about that. Here's the planning for the C1 lateral mass screw. And you can see a fair a 34, a 4.0 by 34 millimeter screw. Again, a fairly robust screw. You can see it there after its placement. This is just a C2 par screw. Here's her vert up here. Here's the final trajectory for the uh, C1 lateral mass screw. Here's the C1 2 transarticular screw. There's the lateral mass and there's the transarticular screw coming up. Here is her skin incision. So she didn't have the, uh, the reference frame. Here's her C1 C2 transarticular on the left side. The whole thing was done through that two centimeter incision. Here's her C1 lateral mass and C2 um, uh, and C2 uh, par screw here on the right side. Just a little bit of derma bond. Here she is on post-operative day one, no collar. She's mobilized immediately. And here she is. Now she's only a two month follow-up, but here's her follow-up CT. And you can see her C1, two lateral mass, C1 lateral mass, C2 far screw. And then on the opposite side, it's very robust C1, C2 transarticular screw. You can see the screw crossing the transarticular area here. We've got put some bone in on this side over here. We put some actual for her. We put BMP off label. Uh, and so, uh, you know, hopefully we'll get a good fusion with her as we move forward. But again, this is uh, this is really the best option for her. Here's another one, 89 year old. And you see a theme here. I'm sure you guys see it just as much as we do. The older population is still staying active and they're still staying uh, and they're healthy and staying living longer and staying active, but they're still getting osteoporosis. This is a guy who presents with a type two odontoid, uh, similar fracture. He gets a C1 lateral mass, C2 uh, PAR screw, and you can see this robust C2 PAR screw that we're able to get in. Uh, you can see the fracture is hugely displaced. Here's his post-operative CT where that is, um, that is, dis that is the we're able to reduce that significantly in this robust fixation. So this is really becoming, like I said, this is now my new favorite case, C1, C2 fixation for uh, folks who are um, not good candidates for anterior odontoid or who have failed uh, odontoid or osteodontoidium. We're gonna skip base here. And as we kind of got a little bit of, uh, well, before I go on to kind of subaxial uh, trauma uh, and some of the other indications, we still have a little bit of time. So I'll run by a few more cases, but does anyone have questions about the C1, C2? Because I think we, we showed some good cases there. 
Hi, hi, hi. Good morning. Um, yeah, I have a quick question. Uh, compared to the uh, open approach for placing the uh, C1 lateral maskers, do you see any uh, difference in uh, post op C2, um, uh, you know, uh, I guess uh, the, the nerve root? Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a big fan of taking really. the root. I'm not a big fan of taking the root when I do them open. I know some people routinely do that. Uh, you know, I figure here in neurosurgery, we're not in the root taking business unless you have to. Uh, and uh, so I typically don't take the root, uh, the the root to begin with. It's nice with the plexus because you don't have to deal with the plexus. Is you're doing it all percutaneously, and if you do get a little bleeding, you can put a little surgery foam in that area, and you just don't have that same bleeding problem you have open. And um, and I'm I'm trying to some of the some of the screws are uh, as you may have noticed are are kind of uh, um, have the uh, are shank screws with the the problem is some of the threads aren't long enough so threads will go there and the short answer to the question is I haven't seen it as a problem I think these old folks are tougher and I think the trajectory lends itself because it's more of a um, it's more of a uh, caudal to cephalad trajectory for whatever reason. Uh, I haven't seen a, a bunch of uh, folks. I've actually talked to some folks about it, and I said that if you know you have that problem, we can go in and back in and take the root. It is something that I was concerned about, but it's just nothing I've seen. Of course, this is just a handful of cases right now, so I'm sure at some point that'll be an issue. It's something I do bring up to my patients and say that if you get a bunch of nerve irritation, we can always go in and take the root if we need to. Great, thank you. And and uh, um, I'm sure you're going to talk about it maybe later. But uh, you know, the first case that you showed, kind of curious if you if you had to do a midline decompression on top of the instrumentation, um, you know, then would you just um, you know add a third incision like a, a midline incision if I, or? If I truly have to do a lot of decompression, I still just do it open. Uh, I'll show you a case where um, I'll show you. Well, I think it might it might have been that case where he was still jumped, um, and and we actually um, did a lateral decompression and got him realigned um, posteriorly. Let me see if we've got that. Yeah, this was the guy. So this guy didn't need to be decompressed, but he was still jumped after his uh, first uh, procedure, ACDF. They didn't get him fully reduced. So he had a unilateral jumped facet that wasn't reduced. And you can see he still has a little bit of subluxation in this big gap here. So during this actual case, we actually went down through that lateral incision. We went down and visualized the joint, uh, drilled it off a little bit and then was able to reduce it. And you can see here, uh, it's tough to see, but maybe on the CT we can see better, but you can see that he is um, he was reduced. So we were able to get, um, there it is there. I think you can see that, the, that he's reduced. So we can do limited decompression laterally. It's a great question, but I'm gonna talk about it. But at really this point, I'm waiting for a master surgeon like Dr. Hartle to, uh, to uh, get together with me so he can, he can do a uh, decompression and I can do a stabilization. One of my partners, Tim Adamson, actually does a lot of minimally invasive cervical decompression work. And he and I have talked about, he and I worked on this project together and we have talked about, uh, you know, ways to do tubular decompressions or minimally invasive decompressions. So um, that is, um, that's a great question, but it's limited right now. Thank you. Absolutely. Those are great questions, by the way. Uh, and so we'll jump in. We'll talk about some subaxial trauma. So after we did it on a couple, uh, you know, we did it in the lab. We did it on some people who are AJAs. And so we decided this is a 44-year-old guy who's neuro intact. He has a left-sided jumped facet. Um, and, uh, um, and so this guy ends up being a, a fairly substantial uh, jump and fairly substantial disc space disruption. And you can see on the ligamentous imaging here, he's got a, a big you know, a pseudo disc slash real disc slash a lot of posterior de decompression. So despite the fact that he was just a unilateral jump and you can see how his foramen is shut down, we decided, uh, and there's his jump over here with the sublux, we decided that he would need an anterior posterior based on his dis disruption. So here he was, done anteriorly and you got a good spacer here and this was uh, all done in the same sitting so he was done under one anesthetic um, and so here here is his anterior 
ACDF, you could see he went from a jump to a perch, but he was still perched. And here's his intraoperative CD. You see the reference frame here. You see the screws kind of going in here. And you can see, even if you can't get a full pedicle screw in because of the vertebral artery anatomy, you still can get a, a, a screw that, that goes to the entrance point of the pedicle. And given the trajectory and the bigger size, it is still more robust fixation than you would typically get with lateral mass fixation. And then through that same lateral angle, we're able to get him reduced. And you can see here he is fully reduced. And uh, so you, you set me up great for that question because here's his, um, here's his post-op imaging. The question was with that subluxation, did he have any kind of vert um, dissection? So we got a CT-CTA post-operatively and you can see the vert is clean and the clean reduction. And so we're able to get that him reduced and get that foramen cleaned out all through that lateral incision. So you can do limited decompression. There's no question about it. Here's his final construct. This is a very robust construct, um, no bracing. Uh, and this guy is mobilized on post-operative day two. Uh, and again, no midline incision posteriorly. So that was, I think, a good case to illustrate some of the things that you were talking about. Here's a guy who was in complete spinal cord injury, but he was motor out. He was in Asia B. He had an ankylose spine. And so we all know how, um, how unstable these spines are. And so you can see he, this guy is Asia B, but miraculously, because he's got his big area of, uh, of signal change, he's got a fractured sublux. He's ankylosed up here. He's got some facet fusion down there. Here's his canal compromise. So he's done anteriorly, and you can see his anterior portion of his procedure. He gets an ACDF, and then he gets a longer plate to give him a little bit more fixation from the front. But here he is posteriorly with the fixation. You can see the, the reference frame on P2. You can see the pedicle screws, the perk placement, where we can't always get the lengths exactly right, just like when you do thoracolumbar. Um, here's his, again, his intraop fiducial. Here is his um, pedicle screws, and you can see the, the difference in the, the size and the length of those screws. Here's his intraoperative reconned pictures. Still have the fiducial in. Here's his tube. This is this guy's final incision. So instead of having a, a big C2 to T2, which this guy likely would have had something like that with that ankylosed spine, he's got C5 to T1, but feel really good about that because look at the size of these screws. Four two, four sixes, and five six diameters. Good lengths, good trajectories. And if you look at the pullout strength of this, is 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 really biomechanically quite robust with the anterior. Here he is at his three month follow up visit. This is the kind type of guy you would expect to see that atrophy, that midline atrophy. And you can see how even with the longer incisions with the with the pedicle screws, how it heals really nicely aesthetically. And more than aesthetically, he's not lying on that wound in these trauma patients, these incomplete spinal cord injuries. They're still in collars or getting put in halos. It's a disaster for them. They got secondary complications like wound infections or lying on their wound and not being mobilized. They're wearing those collars that would probably uh, culture every known bacteria on the face of the earth after they've been laying around the trauma ICU for three or four days. Here's a non-trauma uh, case. So this is a tumor, a 71-year-old with a pathological fracture. He was also treated with a single-stage surgery. You can see his pathological fracture. Tumor has basically replaced the entire vertebral body. Fair, and this guy is neurointact. Fair amount of um, tumor in the posterior elements as well as anteriorly. Fair amount of canal compromise. <clears throat> Here's his imaging. Tumors essentially replaced the vertebral body. Uh, so it goes an anterior corpectomy, a little expandable cage and translational plate. Here's his posterior intraop. You can see the, the uh, tower is still attached to the pedicle screws. And so he just gets buttress screws above and below. Here's his intraoperative recon. Here's his post-op. Here's where his reference frame was. There is incisions. Again, you can see how lateral they go. I'm going to do another tumor quickly is an L5 pathological fracture. 
you can see the interoperative reference frame. Here is interoperative with all the, the towers, and you could see the reference frame and the towers. I mean, fairly, this is the one I showed earlier with that big trajectory, that big lateral to medial trajectory going right down the pedicle into the vertebral body, actually. The rate limiting factor here were the screws up front. So that guy got reasonable fixation. This is an 80, um, this is an 88 year old. This was an interesting one because he was scheduled, he was seen by a different surgeon and he was actually scheduled and consented for a C2 to T2. He was neuro intact and he had a bony chance fracture and no canal compromise. Couldn't get an MRI due to a pacemaker. Here's his fracture, three column injury. You can see it going into all three columns. You can see with an ankylosed spine like that, they're typically very unstable. Here's the fracture, there is a fracture, there is a fracture, fracture. Here's his actual consent form, C2 to T2, open posterior. Here's our intraoperative reference frame. He was Here we are with all the uh, towers and his perk screws. You can see his screws going in with these towers are still attached here. Here's his final construct here. This is one day of wearing a collar it was already all nasty like that. No collar for this guy, no supplemental fixation. You can see the, the incisions all with dermabond. Here's his final construct, fairly robust looking construct, two above, two below, no need to go C2 to T2 short segment C5 to T1, two above, two below, using pedicle screws, medial trajectory, fairly robust construct. And again, you see the CT scan and you see that the anatomy here is dicey. There's no doubt about it. Here's the vert, here's the canal, here's the screw, but that's how good navigation has gotten. And, and, and you know, Bumi is kind of a master surgeon. He was able to do these kind of open pedicle screws with uh, fluoroscopy. And so you don't have to be a master surgeon if you have proper navigation, use proper technique. So this is our case series. We This we, this is what we, we published in the IJSS. It was 27 patients. You see the average age, you see the average follow-up. And there's a range of pathologies that we used here. Uh, here are our complications. One screw is revised intraoperatively without a problem. Two patients required re-op, one for repos reposition of a C5. There was some post-op radicular symptoms and that, taking that screw out and repositioning it, that resolved completely no neuro deficit. And there was one C7 vertebral body that fractured um, that required corpectomy. So to kind of finish it up, uh, that MIS posterior decompression in addition to percutaneous fixation is technically challenging. So for right now, our ideal indications are three or more level ACDF that we want to back up, uh, that where your decompression is being done anteriorly or two or more level corpectomy or anterior posterior 360 procedures where your decompression is mostly anteriorly or C1, C2 or subaxial procedures where no um, decompression is required. C1, C2 fixation is made for this kind of thing. I, I hope that last case that I showed you that had C1 transarticular as well as C1 lateral mass and C2 bar screw shows you what you can do. Uh, you can do a decompression through that lateral exposure. You can do some, uh, some foraminotomy and reduction, but it's limited. It's tenable though, and, and I'm interested to hear Roger's take on that. Uh, limited space for bone grafting, no doubt about it. And, and you know, you can put some bone through that Wiltsy approach. You can rough up the lateral mass. You can do it with a small tube. A lot of times we'll go off label and use an extra small BMP. Uh, and that obviously helps things. Uh, navigation ac accuracy is the name of the game. Uh, it's all about where you put the, the reference frame and some tricks about how you move the table and don't move the table and how you, 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 you don't move the body because um, if you put the fiducial reference frame on C7, T1, T2, usually extremely accurate because you're, if you do move a little bit, the reference frame moves with you, with the body. If you put it on that reference frame on the uh, Mayfield, that's problematic because if the body moves, the body doesn't, the, the reference frame doesn't move. And that's where you can really introduce some inaccuracy and you have to be pay, pay special attention to that. That could be improved uh, from that's a technical issue that the companies need to work out with their navigation. 
So bottom line is percutaneous cervical MIS pedicle screw is uh, feasible with modern navigation. It's biomechanically robust. I think there's no question about that. It is, it is really ideal for that elderly osteoporotic osteopenic uh, population. The lack of muscle disruption is remarkable in terms of wound healing issues and aesthetics. Now, trauma population where people with spinal cord injuries are laying on those wounds and they've still got their collars on because you're worried about lateral mass fixation, um, that is, you know, basically a petri dish waiting to happen. Uh, it is, and so ideal for that. It facilitates less morbid 360 surgery. I'm not a big 360 guy, but now I have a lot lower threshold to back up a three-level ACDF or a two or three-level corpectomy with posterior fixation because I feel like I can do it minimally invasively. Um, and so, you know, further advances in, in posterior uh, decompression techniques will be the key here. And we have, and I see Dan Rue on as well. And so I'd be interested in what you know, Dan and Roger both have to say in terms of the ability to marry this with decompression. But I, it, it exists, like Roger said at the beginning, this is really wide open territory. And now we're finally getting to a place where we can start minimally invasive decompression married to minimally invasive fixation. Uh, it is allows for early mobilization, shortened hospital stay, less morbidities. No, bra I don't brace any of the patients I showed you. Any single one of them did not get any kind of brace postoperatively. And kind of the future is now, and we're excited about it. Thank you for inviting me, and thanks for your attention this morning. Thanks, Tom. That, that was an amazing talk. Uh, I had one question. How, how long does it, what's the learning curve for something like this? It looks fabulous, but if I want to start uh, doing this, how long does it take uh, to get up to speed? How many cases and how long does it take to do your initial cases? Well, uh, one of the, you know, one of the kind of world's expert at this is my resident, Vince Rossi, who he and I have done these cases together. And he's, uh, he's a fourth year resident. And you know, basically after I started doing it, he jumped in with me and within about five cases, he was kind of, he and I were doing, he was doing his side, I was doing my side. Uh, and uh, it is it is the type of thing where I would recommend playing around with it in, in, the, in the lab. And like I talked, I talked a little bit to Roger at the beginning of this, that we did this, we have an O-arm and a stealth system in our outpatient center. And we had we did several cadaver labs before we you know, did this in humans. <laughs> and uh, we started out with uh, people who were Asia A's, Asia B's, and then kind of slowly, uh, in, in, slowly kind of advanced it. But now that series was 27. I think we published that last year. We're up to like somewhere around 50 cases. Uh, but to answer your question, Dan, very, and I would say that for a surgeon who's, who's, who's facilit who has great facility with intraoperative navigation to begin with, it isn't a huge leap of faith. There's some tricks to it as far as the incision, as far as making your pilot hole and being able to find your pilot hole. A lot of that has to do with uh, the navigation guys. And so you need to have that navigation support, you need to have the tech support, and then you need to and be willing to kind of, you know, do it mini open and then, you know, kind of go totally percutaneous after that. Great, thank you. Uh, Dom, so th thanks for, for showing your, your experience and I, uh, uh, a comment and then maybe a question. In terms of the direct decompression, uh, you mentioned, I mean, we, uh, we published our experience with tubular decompression in the cervical spine and that is certainly doable by a, a paramedian approach. So I think in your case, uh, looking at the, the slides that you showed with those paramedian incisions that you make, I would think we would do the same thing that we do in the lumbar spine for an MIS T lift, where you just make an, a fascial incision a little bit more medial on one side and then drop a tube and go in under the microscope and do an over the top decompression. You know, I use a diamond drill for that because you're working very close to the dura. Uh, but it's certainly feasible. Uh, I haven't done it for trauma. I haven't done it for, in, you know, instrumentation as you, but I think uh, it's certainly feasible. You know, my, my concern is obviously um, uh, the, the accuracy, you know, because, and, and I think that's everybody's concern. You know, there's, uh, you know, the spinal cord, nerve, the, the vertebral artery. And I was just wondering, I mean, you showed a, a terrific uh, number of cases now with, with great results. But how do you convince surgeons and how do you convince really the, the surgical public to really adopt this? Uh, do you have data on, on, you know, in a large series on, on accuracy? Has that been quantified? 
the biomechanics, cadaver studies. Uh, I think I think it will take probably more than just case series to to really convince surgeons to to adopt this. Don't don't you think? I absolutely agree, Roger. And uh, we have a protocol that we're submitting to IRB right now to look at. There's only me, Paul Kim, and a couple of our others, Andrew Healy, actually, a couple of our other surgeons who have great facility with uh, navigation are kind of doing this technique. Most people do an open technique. So we're going to do a series that uh, is not going to be randomized because we only have X amount of surgeons doing this, but we're going to compare a consecutive series of open versus uh, versus uh, this technique. And so we want to get it out there, but you're exactly right. The biomechanics are out there. That's done a boomy. And, uh, and if you go to the literature, you'll see that this is an insanely robust thing. The safety is you're, you're exactly right. Uh, and, and, and I would again say that it is, it is, it is at the beginning of the, this process. This is the same thing that people said, as you know, than when, when people were doing uh, minimally invasive thoracal lumbar, it's the exact same thing. Obviously, there's a spinal cord, but it was the same. Is it safe? Is it effective? What's going to happen? Is it going to fuse? The same questions are being asked, rightly so, because it needs to be proved. Having said that, it is something that I think is now feasible and can be done. And you're right, it needs to have a series and you need to prove that is there's less morbidity and the shorter hospital stays and less infections. The only way to do that is to do a series and we are gonna do a prospective series that is controlled, uh, no question about that. But you know, this is here, it's out there. The navigation is that accurate now if you, if you do it properly, uh, you just have to be comfortable with it. And getting back to your issue, uh, your question about the minimally invasive, Absolutely, you can do a little bit of lateral decompression. You can do a mini open with kind of a quadrant type of retractor. Having said that, what you're talking about is kind of you, Dan Rue, Tim Adamson, kind of you know into the canal stuff. And so I haven't gotten there yet, but uh, but we're we're working with some of our guys, and and I think that there will be some decompression that's going to be very feasible. This is early stuff. I don't expect everyone to. You know, I don't want people to see this and then say, hey, that sounds good. Let me try to try that tomorrow. I think there is something that you know you have to be very facile with the navigation and you have to do it in a lab and then and if you're interested i'm happy to talk about some of the subtleties i wasn't trying to do a how-to operation but in terms of drilling your pilot hole the visualization you can get uh etc when when they have these accuracy when these guys get fda approvals typically the accuracy they have to show is two to three millimeters for fda approval well, that's crazy. You can't be two or three millimeters off, as you have already ascertained. So these new systems have gotten so good, they're all the companies shoot for sub-millimeter accuracy, and they've gotten it. So where your accuracy is introduced, inaccuracy is you. And so you've got to, you know, figure out how to minimize that. Um, but again, uh, it is, you know, th th there is enough technology here that allows us to do this without saying somebody is, you know, has to be this kind of grandmaster surgeon, it's dependent on the, the technology and the technology is here. Yeah, I, uh, I, I totally understand, of course. I think, navig I mean, you said, I used, navigation can be very tricky and misleading. You gotta be really careful. And, and I use more navigation than, than most surgeons, but you gotta be really, really careful so I, I disagree with your statement that you don't have to be a good surgeon if you don't use navigation. I think it has its own pitfalls, you know? And well, you have to be a good surgeon, you don't have to be a master surgeon, right. and it does have its own pitfalls. You know, when I first started doing navigation, my party line was it slows a good surgeon down and it makes a bad surgeon dangerous. Uh, and so you have to have a, uh, you have to have a facility with it and you have to have an, an inherent feel for when something is just not right. You know, you have to look at your other cues, your visual cues. Is this trajectory what I would expect if I was doing an open case? Does this make sense where I am multiple um, multiple times during the case? You go back to your reference frame and make sure you've maintained your accuracy. Always, you know, sound everything with a navigated uh, track. Is what, you know, and so there are tricks to it. There's no doubt about it but it is doable based on the technology that exists right now. Right. It's not flying car stuff, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah, no, I totally, totally agree. Uh, are there any other questions from uh, the audience? Comments, questions? 
Well, hi, Dr. Korch. This is Susie Wallard. I'm a PA. I thought that was a fantastic talk. And I just was wondering if how you proceed if you do run into to navigation problems during the surgery. Yeah, it, 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 we haven't had that actually. And like I said, it's a limited series, but uh, we would just, you know, we would just potentially open the incision, the lateral incision and just go all the way down open and do what you needed to do with an open as opposed to a percutaneous. You don't have to go to the midline. You can do everything you need to do with make, just bringing that incision with retractors like a Wiltsey. Uh, you know, Wiltsey is a lumbar technique. Uh, Leon Wiltsey described uh, this would be a cervical Wiltsey where you just go down, identify the lateral masses, and you can put in lateral mass screws, you can put in pedicle screws. Uh, there's various things you can do to kind of salvage it, but that was always our, uh, our idea that you know, we could always go open if we needed to. Thank you. Thanks, Susie. All right, um, thank you so much. Thanks everyone. And uh, looking forward to, uh, to uh, hearing more about your work. And that was a great, great presentation. It's really important, as I mentioned, uh, because it is, it is really the, the, the way forward for MIS. And, and we have to somehow figure out how to translate the MIS work, work from the lumbar spine also to the cervical spine. So I think this is an important uh, step in that direction. Thank, thanks, Tom. Thanks for having me, Roger. It's really an honor. I appreciate it. And I'll do a quick plug for, like Roger said, I'm chair of the NSCNS Spine Section. Spine Summit is going to be June, I mean, I'm sorry, February 23rd to the 26th in Caesars Palace in Las 